Hi, I'm here with Daniel. Daniel, can you tell me who you are, what you do, and how long you've been doing it for, please? Sure. Um, my name is Daniel Stalviak. I'm um, a UK a British entrepreneur of Polish extraction. I am the founder and managing director of My Dog Safe, which is an electronic signature and client portal platform catering primarily to professional services firms and i've been doing it for the last 10 years oh okay so what made you start my dog safe well it was well there was an anecdote that i tell people but it's a bit long but in a nutshell i wanted it for myself i wanted um a tool where which would host securely all my mission critical documents and I would like ideally someone else to really manage and 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 do all the housekeeping for me uh, and that's where that's the basically the idea behind my dog safe we, we built a cloud document management system similar to Dropbox added electronic signature facility similar to DocuSign packaged it made it much cheaper than either of them and started offering it to professional services firms and and how long have you been doing that for so in a couple of weeks we'll have 10 year anniversary of company incorporation congratulations thank you and and how long have you had product in market for of that 10 years um uh, i would say probably around six or seven so the first three years we were pretty much building the products our first paying client came in in 2016 great okay and the trajectory of many businesses in software as a service is it is it a subscription service what's what's the business yes. is a subscription so yes. the often the trajectory of the commercial trajectory of those businesses can be a hockey stick sometimes it it, it can be there can be a slow climb while, while you reach a product market fit and and also the the volume of customers that that you need how's how's the journey been how's the growth journey been I think it's, in our case, it's more of a step function uh, where there is a brief period of hockey stick and then and then more of a gradual plateau and then another one with each step driven primarily by either a change of strategy or uh, let's say acquisition of a new channel partner uh, or a very successful marketing campaign. Um, but if you zoom out of that step function, it pretty much looks like a gradual uh, line with with a little bit of a zigzag. Right. And I, and I bet because of the business that you're in, you're very data driven. Of course. Yes. And more and more so as we grow, as as, as we um, get more data. But, um, well, the, the sort of the growth trajectory is also driven by the way that by your capital structure. Do you have institutional investors? Are you bootstrapped? Um, you know, how aggressive your growth ambitions are. And in our case, because... We did not go for institutional money. We made a conscious decision of slowing down growth um, and focusing primarily on a great product. And we were fortunate to break even relatively early, uh, which gave us the comfort to, to basically build a great piece of technology and not really worry about KPIs or, or external pressures for growth. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, institutional money does put pressure on entrepreneurs. Often it it's... Uh... You know, they expect you to go all out very quickly. Uh, that can destroy some businesses and it can put intense pressure on teams. Have you found developing your team over the last few years? Has that has have you got a rock solid team? Has there been quite a lot of churn in your team? How do you how do you structure it? I've been very fortunate. Uh, basically, most of the people I work with now have been with me since the very beginning. And uh, to me, that's one of the key factors in 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 our you know modest but still nevertheless a, a success in, in being able to break even without without much funding uh, a solid team means there is a lot of institutional memory and as the time grows we just do things faster and faster because we've built a lot of lego boxes and suddenly we realize we can add value on top of that piece of tech no one needs to learn uh you know from scratch uh, uh to, to sort of understand how to do it new people newcomers have the challenge because they they cannot be really productive straight away and and for that reason we all we decided that uh we're not going to um over hire 
because that slows us down dramatically. You know, if there, I've even tried some metrics of, of trying to figure out how many people do I need uh, in order to double the speed of, of production, so to speak. I mean, we're producing code. So you could also say that there is a speed of production for features and, and code. And it feels that you need to bring in four or five times more people to double the speed. So for a small business like ours, that makes absolutely no commercial sense at the, at the moment. We are much faster, even though we're small. And this is a paradox. Uh, we hope to be able to afford uh, you know, a, a major uh, a recruiting campaign next year, but uh, but only when when we have, I would say, a very good plan of how to ingest those new hires because there are big costs yeah. involved in that. Yes, there are. And it could be expensive to get the wrong people as well, as, as we all know. I think some people in other industries might be surprised at the that the ratio between bringing new people in and the productivity isn't more, isn't more, you know, that, that, that you don't get out with the extra headcount. It's not just about laying pipe or it's not just about producing widgets because it's a team effort. Um, have you, what, what systems and processes have you installed into the team in order to make sure that your pro productivity is there and that any new team members that come in are going to be able to work as productively as possible? Yes. Yeah, so, so here uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a puzzle and well, there are processes there. Are, we, we, inst we, we uh, deployed several processes to capture knowledge and document it, digitize it so that it's there for newcomers. So for example, let's say this Zoom call, if the, you know, we, we do Zoom calls every day, several times a day, sometimes depending on the need and problem, and we make lots of mistakes. I mean, that's, I would say it's almost a sign of productivity and, and of a good team that we make lots of mistakes because we learn from them, we iterate, and then we try to figure out, well, how not to make those mistakes again and we then document the, the the sort of a potential approach if there is a human process that needs to be changed, and then we record it, and then we put it somewhere, and a new someone new comes in, and they they look at it and say, oh, okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So this is almost like an overhead of housekeeping after productive session. So this is a very non-productive session, but still valuable because it's almost sort of embeds the, the 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 discovered knowledge within the team, but that later makes training new people easier. Yeah, no, that's and that's really great learning. So you you're kind of integrating, perhaps is it lean methodology that you're using, and then you're taking those learnings and recording them. Is that the basis of your your system? Yes, yes, pretty much. So so you know we do we do the sprints, we do the Kanban, we do the agile, all of that. Uh, but but that's sort of the, the the sort of the positive path where everything works well. Now we we. We are ISO 27001 certified, so we need to have, have stress tests. We need to have that institutional knowledge because we need we we have sort of instilled a, a continuous improvement in our processes. It's part of our DNA, uh, not just because of the certification, but because it's just good business. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. What what is your headcount? How many staff have you got inside the business? If a dozen people. Right. How many? Sorry. A dozen dozen people okay so that's enough that's definitely enough to keep you busy um and is uh, the team structure you run you run the whole team do you yes well we have head of engineering who um i would say i mean i'm not interfering of course in in the sort of the architecture of the system we have a separate devops and and also that that's a sort of almost a separate vertical we have a test a testing team that is also semi-independent and then in terms of marketing that's pretty much just me uh, and the and the team so um because we're still small everyone knows everyone else there is a lot of all hands on deck when needed but we definitely don't have any unnecessary um sort of meetings where where, where people need to listen to things that are not really relevant to them I, I think it's much more opting in do you need do you need to know do you need to spend your time listening and then then you're part of the meeting yeah. Okay. Have you so you've built up a meeting rhythm inside the business then? I'm sorry. You've built up a meeting rhythm inside the business. Yes, there is a meet meeting rhythm. Um, it's it's sort of um, uh, diff different sort of constellations of the team 
at, on different days of the week, depending on the topic. And then, of course, when we have a big release or something really got wrong, then we have a slightly different format where we need pre-work and we need some brainstorming. We need some, you know, sort of system-wide decisions. Yeah. Uh, so I would say we have three formats for meetings, but I, I'm telling you this now only because you asked. It, it's not like we actually have that format written down somewhere. It just happens okay. that way. It's always good to get structure in, in any business or and sometimes structure can come in the form of habit, which is not necessarily a bad thing when it becomes very natural inside a business. So um, what about the growth of the business? How, how, do, how, firstly, how do you identify your product as being different in the market? What's its USP? Well, there's two simple things one is the breadth of the product uh, and then then it's price so you know we believe we are better than DocuSign and we are less than half as expensive uh, so that's a starter for anyone who needs to sign but then on top of that you have um workflow automation tools you have um electronic questionnaires you have secure client portals you have ability to run id checks and uh, stitch up end-to-end -end processes for onboarding clients so we can solve very simple problems such as just get your documents signed cheaper or why don't you automate your entire customer onboarding or employee onboarding workflow which takes weeks costs tons of money and you could stitch it up and and run it electronically through us so we have this breadth of solutions that can appeal to very small businesses but also we have large businesses that work with us so that's, I would say, a blessing and a curse because, you know, we definitely don't want to be everything to everybody. Yeah. We're pretty much are solving a genre of, of digital problems, which I would call um, sort of the, the relationship problems or sort of getting started um, with someone so that there is data, trust and money that need to change hands between someone on the inside of the organization and someone on the outside. Yeah. And this is something that is problematic because you don't want to do this over you know, letterbox or an encrypted email, you need a, something in the middle, which is secure, encrypted, and, and allows you for that automation. And that's where we sit. And that problem is universal across industries and across sizes of companies. Yeah. And that's what we've discovered so far. So in terms of your growth goals for the next 12 months, um, have you identified, you don't have to go into detail, though you can, of course, um, have you identified where you see the growth coming from? Yes, so the, we we realized that as, as a small team, um, the most bang for the buck, so to speak, is uh, we, we get from, um, from automation, from standardization of uh, specific narrow use cases. So we have this, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a, a set of Lego boxes from which we can stitch up lots of things for different people, but we can't do all of them. So we pick one at a time and then try to do it really well. So the next thing we do, we're going to do is actually completely rewrite our uh, proposals module uh, to, to allow professional services firms to sign up their clients end to end from service selection through to contract and payment and ID checks, et cetera, in a much slicker way than our legacy product. And that is this could appeal to four or five industries. Um, and once we have that, we're going to move on to the next one. We already we have already identified it. It's going to be actually a retail product. I can't tell you more, but um, just just to to give you a flavor of it, we have you know hundreds of thousands of portals created by people who hold their documents in there. It's like having a wallet. Yes. Well, you could put many things in a wallet. Yes. You could use it in a, in a number of different ways. And we've identified that as a big opportunity for growth for us. So we will make that wallet much more useful uh, than it is right now. Right. So the product is being sold internationally? Yes. Primarily in English-speaking countries, although we have just translated our, um, our app into almost a dozen languages. Wow, that's incredible. A dozen languages. That's very impressive. And must have been a considerable amount of work. Um, and how many well, users... Google Translate and uh, ChatGPT are great tools uh, in that process. They they are great tools. That they, they um, but it still needs a human at, at the uh, just to do the final checks. I often find um, so, sometimes Google Translate can give you some slightly strange 
So we would call it beta translations. I'm, I'm you know, I, I can't. <laughs> I, I do hope that users who um, will will spot mistakes and then let us know about them. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm, uh, that and that's really useful. How many How many um users do you have globally now? Well, we we are we are sort of. I don't want to tell you precise numbers, but we're talking about hundreds of corporates and tens of thousands of uh, of ten of end users. So it's um. I would say um, modest when you compare us to DocuSign, but sufficiently su sufficient to give us enough feedback data and and ultimately money to to continue innovating and and uh, building our our presence in the market. Yeah, I mean you're in a market where there are some um, alternative gorillas in the room um, with the likes of DocuSign and PandaDoc and, and and some of those things that have very very uh, defined uses. It sounds like your product has got more uses and I completely understand the requirement for a digital wallet. I mean, it, it makes a huge amount of sense for all of us. Um, having all, all our documents, all our all our data in different places that, that needs to be secured in, in one place makes makes a lot of sense. And uh, and people struggle with that. I, I personally struggle with that. So I can, I can really understand the, the potential for growth in the business. So, what are the main challenges at the moment in your in your business journey? We we often look at um, as as business coaches. What we often look at is we look at some of the, the three kind of key areas. They're usually time, the amount of time the the team is spending developing the the product or the or the market, or how much resource you're putting in into certain things, or it's um, team. It's recruiting, retaining, training productivity measuring productivity or money um there's simple cash coming in the business we're in a very um challenging environment at the moment for many businesses because of the cost of living crisis so so what are your pain points what are the challenges that you're facing at the moment oh well um uh, what are the challenges that the, you 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 mentioned quite a few already. Um, yes, it is very difficult to hire. It is very difficult to embed new new members of the team who don't know the code base, especially in a company that has you know lots of tech um, and productivity drops because you need lots of overheads to train and 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 bring those people up to speed. So and for that you need processes. Um, so. This challenge is ahead of us. We, as, as I mentioned, we're we're hoping that from from next year we are going to to expand the team, but and we are preparing actively for that big event. And the way we prepare for it is to create an institutional structure to allow us to minimize the sort of the drop in productivity of the existing team, and still allow for the for the for the training of newcomers. Because in a small business, ultimately, it's the key decision makers, the most productive members of the team, suddenly having to earmark a chunky amount of their time, training someone who may not even last or uh, you know for that long because they may burn out or they may decide to go elsewhere. So it's a huge risk. It is. It is a huge risk. It's a real challenge for lots of businesses in, in the software industry um, with... Um, Let's just say that the engineers can be quite promiscuous. They get lots of offers because of the lack of talent in perhaps in the UK or even when you're near shore. Um, and and dealing with that is uh, I've witnessed it many times with software businesses. And um, it's it's a constant battle, isn't it? It's a constant battle. So have you got any strategies in place? Don't need to tell me right now what they are, but do you have any strategies in place to be able to deal with those challenges? Yeah, I've I've received interesting. Well, I've I'm definitely shop, shop, shopping for advice. So we have, uh, um, I've been to a number of sort of uh, meetings for entrepreneurs. The last one was at the uh, Cranfield University, where I where I had some very interesting advice from from prominent business leaders. I brought in a new um, uh, non executive director who's helping me a lot um, with, with with the processes. So it's it's a it's a discovery process. Yeah. Um, and I've also been fortunate to be part of Santander X100 uh, acceleration program, which has given me access to tons of advice from from various sort of consulting firms. Um, and if I were to distill all of that, it it, it pretty much 
it's a, a bit of a chicken and egg problem because ultimately you need to spend money to bring in the the expertise in house. Yes. Pretty much, I would need a CTO whose only job is to train other people, uh, and those other people would then probably uh, not bother the, the existing development team, and then we I would pretty much create almost like a separate um, vertical inside the organization. And I think that you know conceptually it makes sense; it's, it's least disruptive, but it's most expensive. And it's also the fastest. So pretty much I, I I have those three variables, you know, it's the speed, it's the cost and it's disruption. And I need to, uh, I would say, calibrate it to my need uh, and affordability at that time. Yeah. And there's always going to be pressures inside the business with regards to where to deploy revenue, um, particularly since you effectively you guys have funded your business through growth, which is extremely admirable. Lots of software businesses would be looking to, get institutional investment and think that that's the route to market. You've done something very different. You've developed your, your business from, from your own, um, from natural. We have, we have angels, we have angels, but only yeah. angels. Yeah. Um, but you haven't, you haven't looked outside for institutional money, which is oh. what, which, which, as I say, I think that's admirable because it, it provides a different tension inside the business. Um, and, and, and so in terms of growing your market share, uh, with with regards to the marketing, those those plans are they are they in place in the way that you want them to be in place? Are they are you on course for for b- delivering the growth that you want to deliver? Well, I mean, it's that's to be seen. The plans are being crafted right now, uh, and we have pretty much you know. Uh, it's not sort of rocket science uh, given, you know, if you know that we are an e-sign and a portal provider, there is an element of viral marketing because anyone who uses us becomes exposed to our brand. So that's one leg that we want to focus on. Uh, we are now um, expanding our um, uh, sort of the channel partners we work with uh, in various geographies, which which is a, I would say expensive, but um uh, route to market, but also very rapid if if you get the right partners. And then the third one is is content marketing. We we uh, we publish um, the th- thought leadership pieces. We publish news. We uh, we write about about the industries we we work in uh, because we believe we we have something to say. And and that also helps not only with SEO but with engagement. And and those three things combined, we we believe will will work. But okay. I will show. Yeah, it will indeed. And you've got an exciting product. So um, so what does the future look like for, for you yes. and your business? So I am cautiously optimistic uh, because I, um, as I mentioned, I have uh, very good advisors and a very solid team that has been around with, uh, with, with, with the business for a long time. And we are aligned on the strategy. So we, we are now, we had, we spent the last, I would say, 12 months um, really trying to understand the growth levers. Was like, how do we scale? How do we scale this beyond, uh, uh, you know, the, the, our current, I would say, parameter? And and I think we have a solid strategy. We know what we're doing. We are pretty much in execution mode. And um, you know, keeping our eyes open on, on how to fine tune it. But um, what what's exciting is that we hope that the heavy lifting sort of thinking process is, is over. Of course, the world changes so quickly that, you know, you go into the battle and the plans have to be torn on the first day. Um, we've done this many times before. I mean, look, I've, we, we, um, I had to change strategy several times before. I'm not uh, worried about it. But it's, it's, this, it's this sort of honeymoon period when you still are not certain that the plans you've drafted are wrong. So yeah. you go with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't remember which famous army general said, um, "Plans are useless until you haven't got one." Um, <laughs> so, so you know, it's imperative to constantly review that plan, but not be not be wedded to it. To to have a vision outside of it, and it sounds like you, you guys are being really flexible as that. So, um, so it sounds like you're 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 more or less on track with your growth goals. There's some challenges ahead. Uh, opening up the different distribution channels is is a great thing to do. Clearly, um, uh, as a business owner, what's your biggest lesson over the, the over the last few years? Well, 
you know, we've had COVID, we have war in Ukraine, we have completely unpredictable things. Uh, so uh, I would say, you know, all of these were very humbling experiences um, which affected so many people. And and here we are you know, on this little boat building a business. So, you know, uh, one lesson is that, well, no matter how much how hard we work and how 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 much we think there is sometimes very little that we can actually do a, a, about about a situation and we just need to accept it and accepting that certain doors are closed or you know a certain segment industry is no no longer for us because of a change a dramatic change in situation is a very hard i would say thing to to admit to oneself and then move on. But I think that that's what we had to do uh, be, uh, over the last few years, and we've done it. So, so to me, you know, it's it's a hard won lesson that, um, you know, hard decisions need to be made, even if they if you feel that you're destroying value or if if an opportunity passes you by. But that's that's what you have to do. Yeah. And I think that's probably the main the main lesson from last from the last few years. Yeah, it resonates with the with the book, the hard thing about hard things. I don't know if you've ever read that. It's a great book about uh, about someone who developed very successfully um, a, a software business and and then and then uh, went exited the business and and then set up a very very successful VC. Um, but some of the learnings from that are very very attuned to what you've just been saying. It's adapt or die. Be flexible look what the market's telling you don't close your eyes to new ideas or, or radical thought because that's the thing that may drive your business forward and that's exactly what you've done so and and being agile in in your environment i would have thought would have been possibly the biggest strength that you could have is that would that be right uh well in, in the software business you know everyone claims they're doing agile um doing it actually isn't as straightforward as you think but um, but agile not just as in the working practice but being agile as a business being able oh, to oh yes well well absolutely i mean but i would say that agility is only half of the story because in many cases things just happen you know a, a channel partner ditches you or someone you work with gets acquired and is no longer interested in your partnership or someone gets into a partnership with you know without actually being honest and and doesn't deliver. I mean, there are lots of things that just happen, even though the opportunity is there. You think, and th that's where it's it's just about having the the wherewithal to move on past that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if if you, if you would call it agility. It's almost it's it's just it's just business, isn't it? Yes, although. It sounds to me that you have been more um, reactive to the situation because you have that mindset. Some businesses remain quite rigid, and it sounds like you've been flexible with your business and your business model and and, and made the smart moves, which is great because you, you've ended up with a really great business and you're developing it and you're growing it still in challenging environments um, and in a challenging sector as well. So. So well done to you. I think it's I think it's formidable what you've done. So thank you, yeah. thank you. I, well, look, uh, as a sole founder, I would say there are lots of drawbacks to to setting up a business on your own. I mean, part of the uh, one of the biggest drawbacks is that uh, institutional money isn't particularly interested in in uh, sole founders. So in many ways, that was the route that I knew I was embarking on from the very beginning. I yeah. pretty much knew that that uh, it's angels and that's it. Yeah, yeah, okay, and yeah, that's you. You knew what your options were, and then you developed what you had to develop around those options. You you drilled down, you focused, and you and you made the right choices clearly because of the situation that you're in now. So, um, have you got any plans that you'd like to share with us? Well, I already told you that you know, the, the two things we're doing. Uh, I think the retail product uh, is is probably the biggest uh, single uh, announcement we'll be making, uh, but not just yet. Uh, so I ca I can't tell you more. Um, but I'd love to be able to update you yeah. when when we do release it, and uh, we we hope to make a big splash out of that. Yeah, no, that's 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 exciting. So, if I could take you back to when you're 18 years old. 
what advice would you give now to your 18 year old self start early i would say um well look i'm i'm of polish extraction so you know when i was 18 um you you know the the reality of 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 my sort of of my country at the time has 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 very little resemblance to what it is right now so um but as a as an entrepreneur i would say that i probably already knew then that i would i wanted to build something and to run something uh, but I didn't have the means or the confidence to to even think about it seriously. And and the surrounding environment wasn't really receptive to 18-year-olds starting businesses. I mean, you know, to set up a limited company probably would take a fortune and three months of work, et cetera. And here in the UK, it takes 10 minutes yeah. or 15, let's say. Uh, so, so there are certain ambitions that have to wait um, but if you can start early, that's probably the lesson. That's 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 lovely. Well, look, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, we wish you continued success with your business. We would love to be kept up to date with with what you guys are doing, and um, good luck. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.